My brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Hello, my friend. My name is Duke Duvall. I'm your host for Conquering Your Giants. Those of you who have been longtime viewers, I thank you. Can you imagine that we've been doing these programs for more than 10 years now? And our goal is to get into the Word of God, that the Word of God gets into us and equips us, just like in that opening segment each week, to take our stand against the one who has vaunted himself against Almighty God. Can you imagine that Lucifer, the worship leader in heaven, who we now know as Satan, would think that he was capable of being greater than his creator. What folly, what rebellion. And yet, through the infection that each of us receives at our physical birth, we become at odds with God. And we have to die to self in order to live in Christ. And I want to talk to you today about a very misunderstood phrase, I think. I think in 35 years of ministry, I have found that a lot of people don't quite grasp what Jesus is saying when he says, take up your cross and follow me. For example, we have to stop and think when Jesus said that to his disciples. He had not yet revealed to them how he was going to die. Now, you may never have thought of that. I know that I hadn't until I began studying for this segment today. Jesus had not revealed how he was going to die. He had revealed that he was going to die. But to the Jewish mindset, stoning was the way that they typically killed somebody that they considered to be a blasphemer. Stephen, the first Christian martyr, you know, there in the book of Acts, where Saul, who of course would become Paul, was giving consent. They were laying their clothes at the feet of Saul. Maybe he didn't want to get his hands bloody, so to speak. But how did they kill Stephen? They stoned him to death. Crucifixion was a Roman form of execution. Jesus had not revealed to his disciples that he was going to die on the cross when he said to them, take up your cross. And we'll get into that more, but I wanted to set the foundation with an old song that, like with me, I was not familiar with it, but I thought, what words? And I thought maybe it would bless you as we start this particular segment on taking up our own cross to live for Christ. I walked one day along a country road, and there a stranger journeyed too. Bent low beneath the burden of his load, it was a cross, a cross I knew. The refrain goes, take up thy cross and follow me. I hear the blessed Savior call, how can I make a lesser sacrifice when Jesus gave his all. Next verse says, I cried Lord Jesus and he spoke my name. I saw his hands all bruised and torn. I stooped to kiss away the marks of shame, the shame for me that he had borne. Oh, let me bear thy cross, dear Lord, I cried. And lo, a cross for me appeared. The one forgotten I had cast aside, the one so long that I had feared. My cross I'll carry till the crown appears. The way I journey soon will end where God himself shall wipe away all tears. Think of that. And friend holds fellowship with friend. Let me give you the refrain one more time. Take up thy cross and follow me. I hear the blessed Savior call. How can I make a lesser sacrifice when Jesus gave his all. I want you to look at this first verse on your screen as we dive into this wonderful study of taking up our cross. 
Matthew 16, 24 and 25. Just read it out loud with me, if you care to. As I read it to you, just read it out loud. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself. And just think about that a minute. Don't rush through this. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, and take up his cross, and follow me. For whosoever will save his life. My friend, how important is this passage? Do you want to save your life? Do you want to live in eternity in heaven? For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. Whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. Keep in mind when Jesus said that, he had not revealed to them the form of execution that was going to take him from physically being alive to physically dying that he might be resurrected. There are many things, and maybe we should do an entire segment one day, just on the crucifixion itself. I know that sometimes when we have had this program coincide with Good Friday and Resurrection Sunday, we have talked about the crucifixion from a medical perspective and what Jesus went through. It was horrendous. The pain, the agony. But you know, there are just some very basic things. And... I know that we have young ones that watch this program, but I don't think that this is out of place. To say that typically during crucifixion, again, you'll notice that the Pharisees appealed to the Roman leadership, Pilate, that he would crucify or have crucified this one that they classified as a blasphemer, Jesus. Because it was the Romans typical form of execution. The people in that area knew certain things about it. And they knew a lot about crucifixion, actually, because there were, during that period of years, some 30,000 people crucified. There was an occasion where there were more than 800 crucified at one time. These are some of the secular records that we see. It's not shown in the Bible as such, but if you do some archaeological study and some replacement of some of the discussions within the texts uh, for Jewish history, you find that there was probably on one occasion more than 2,000 criminals executed in a short period of time, all by crucifixion. So there were times when there was hundreds times when there might have been thousands that were crucified. So people knew that typically to humiliate the one being crucified, they would strip them naked. And I realize that for a lot of the medieval paintings that we have, we see Jesus very placidly, very peacefully on a cross, and he's clothed partially. But the reality is this is torturous, that he would go to the cross and very likely be nude. What a humiliation to a Jewish man who was raised in modesty. For him to have the hairs pulled from his face, his beard plucked out to where his face was bleeding, a mock crown shoved down on his head, and this part of the scalp, one of the most vascular portions of your entire body, in other words, subject to bleeding at just a pinprick, and to think that they shoved thorns upon thorns on his head. And here he is bleeding. He's been beaten in a way that probably would have killed most men. Now then, he's forced to carry his cross 
Joseph has to help him, plucked from the crowd to help this one that he didn't even know. And so it is that crucifixion was a reality in that day. But even before Jesus revealed how he was going to die, he begins talking about the disciples. And through the disciples, he begins talking to you and to me about taking up our cross. Now, as you'll see in this brief study that we have today, he wasn't talking about pain that you need to bear or somebody that's a thorn in your side. We often use it in that regard. You might say, well, my mother-in-law is my cross that I have to bear. Well, she might think the same thing about you, but that's not what Jesus is saying here. He's talking about death. He's talking about you and me dying to self and living for God. I want you to look at this next verse. And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Read it with me again. I'm going to personalize it. And if you don't bear your cross, sir, ma'am, and come after me, you cannot be my disciple. Now, that's a strong statement. What is Jesus saying to us here? Well, 1 John 5, 2 says, By this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and keep His commandments. So there is an aspect of taking up our cross. We've got to walk in the words of Jesus. Now, don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm not saying that it is your obedience to the law that saves you. We'll see that very clearly. But there is an aspect of coming unto Christ where we surrender ourselves. In fact, in a recent program, I utilized something from a little booklet that a man had given me recently called Dying to Live with Christ. And I'm going to do something I don't think I've ever done in the 10 plus years that we have been doing Conquering Your Giants, and that is to read something, it's very brief, in very recent programs. But I'm going to violate that typical principle today because it is so applicable to what we're talking about in taking up our own cross. Here's how one man saw his journey of dying to self and living for God. Oh, the bitter pain and sorrow that a time could ever be when I proudly said to Jesus, all of self and none of thee. Yet he found me, I beheld him, bleeding on that cursed tree. And my wistful heart said faintly, okay, some of self and some of thee. And day by day, his tender mercy, healing, helping, full and free, brought me lower. And then I whispered, less of self and more of thee. He's getting there, isn't he? This man writing this, he's, he's dying to self. Higher than the highest heaven, deeper than the deepest sea. Lord, thy love at last has conquered none of self and all of thee. My friend, this life has not been intended for us to just be healthy, wealthy, and wise. It hasn't been for us to be comfortable. It hasn't been for us to be a lot of things that we have come in our flesh to conclude that we are destined for. We have gained a very worldly look at this God that we claim to worship. And we often treat him like a bellhop God, I'm coming to you today to place my order, and I need for you to run out and get these for me. My friend, you and I have been called to die. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who was a minister during Hitler's reign of terror, a minister who was eventually executed himself in Germany 
during World War II for resisting Hitler. And he said, when God calls a man, when God calls a woman, he's inviting you to die. Is that something you are willing to do, my friend? Because if you don't die to self, Jesus has already told us in the scriptures we've read today, you can't be my disciple. Somebody has noted that this world has many options, but eternity only two. And my friend, I would say to you that a hundred years from today, very likely, even for the children watching this program, it's very likely that a hundred years from today, you won't be in the world anymore. But let's just say a thousand years from today. Not one of you watching this program is going to be in the earth as we know it right now. Where will you be? There are only two options according to the word of God, heaven and hell. Jesus said, if you don't die to self and live for me, you can't be my disciple. You're not going to be where I go to prepare a place. The Jewish people hated that, the Pharisees. The leaders that Jesus disrupted and knocked over their cart, took their leadership and exposed them as the hypocrites that he called them out to be. And there are many people today who would say, oh, I'm a Christian. Yeah, the man upstairs and I, we have a, we have a great relationship. I would remind you, my friend, that there's one who had a very good resume, apparently, according to Jesus, who began to plead with him on the final day, Lord, Lord, did I not do many mighty miracles in your name? Did I not prophesy in your name? Did I not cast out demons in your name? What's Jesus' response? I'll say to him, I never knew you. Leave, leave. I never knew you. I never had a relationship with you. I want you to think about that as we look at this next scripture. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any wicked way in me. And, God, please, please lead me in the way everlasting. Are you willing to come before God daily and just say, God, search me? God, look at me with your x-ray vision. Look through me. Expose the wickedness of my flesh, my carnal ways, my rebellious nature. Because, Lord, I want to die to that old man. I want to take up my cross. I want to die to self and I want to follow you. The Bible says that we have to examine ourselves to see if we're in the faith. My friend, you and I, if we're like that one that Jesus talked about in the parable, if we stand at the gate of heaven, so to speak, one day, and we take our pitiful little resume, every one of you has probably made a resume somewhere along the way, applying for a job, you put down all of your education, you put down all of your skills, your work history, you give it to your employer in hopes that you're going to get a job. Well, that's how a lot of people see heaven. They think, I'm going to present to God on Judgment Day, my life history, as though he didn't already know it. And you're hoping and crossing your fingers, perhaps, saying, oh, I sure hope that I have 51% good in my life and only 49% bad in my life, because then God's going to be obligated to let me in heaven. Well, I would submit to you that it's a pretty big deal to cast out demons. It's a pretty big deal to do miracles. It's a pretty big deal to prophesy in the name of Jesus Christ. So a man that is standing there with a resume like that, 
is going to put my little pitiful life resume to shame. How about you? But when you consider that that resume ends with Jesus saying, I'm asking you to leave. I'm commanding you to leave. Depart from me, you evildoer. I never knew you. All these things that you claimed to do in my name, you weren't doing them in my name because I don't know you. My friend, there are people standing behind pulpits every Sunday and they have never died to self. There are people sitting in church pews of every denomination and they go, quote, religiously, but they have never died to self. Jesus says, take up your cross. And he's not saying that your burden of cancer is your cross to bear. We often talk in those terms. That's not really biblical. To be sure, that's a trial. That is a big test. Some of the other challenges that we go through in life, an accident that leads to the accidental death of a loved one or a baby. These are huge trials. But that's not the cross that Jesus is talking about when he says, take up your cross. He's saying, you have to die to you that you might live in me. Look at this next verse. I want you to drink in what Paul is saying. I want you to drink in, even as you read this Galatians 2.20 with me, that here is one who had a resume so far beyond my resume, and may I say respectfully, very likely, so far ahead of your earthly resume. The Pharisee, Saul, who became Paul, who was by his own admission faultless in the Mosaic law, and he would later say, all of that I count as rubbish. I count it as dung compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ. And now then he says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. And yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh. Think about it. I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. There's so much we could say on that passage alone. But my friend, in simplest terms, you may have somewhere in your Christian experience said, you know what, it's not really fair that I'm counted a rebel because my great, 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 great granddaddy Adam was a rebel. Well, think about fairness as you will. How fair is it that Jesus Christ, the second Adam, took all of your stinking sins and all of my stinking sins upon himself, nailed it to the cross, never to be counted against you again. And that's what Paul says. After keeping the Mosaic law, after being faultless in the ceremonies of religiosity, though I have not yet arrived completely, he would say elsewhere, I have been crucified. In that crucifixion, that day, on Golgotha, on the old rugged cross. Jesus Christ died. But if you have trusted him as your savior, you died in Christ. You were represented on that cross. You came into this world as a follower of the first Adam. And you had a destiny ahead of you called hell. But dear friend, if you die, in Christ, he has gone to prepare a place for you where there'll be no more suffering, 
no more sorrow, no more sickness, no more goodbyes. And he'll wipe away every tear from our eyes because we have died to self and we're now alive with Christ. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, I'm asking in the name of Jesus that we would take to heart what you're telling us to do here. That we have been called to take up our own cross, to willfully, as Jesus willfully picked up his cross, that we are to willfully die to self. To be raised to the newness of life, never to die again. That is my heart's cry for everyone watching this program today. That he would examine himself, sir, that you would really take to heart what God is saying to you here. Ma'am, that you would examine yourself to see if you're in the faith. That we would follow you, Lord Jesus. No, we won't follow you perfectly in this life. But when we fail you, we will feel that sting of our sin will feel the Holy Ghost conviction of having failed you. You who are perfectly holy and in our sin, we failed you. But we're so thankful that that old man, that old woman is dead and that like Paul, we can now say, I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and who gave himself for me. Lord, help us to take up our cross today, to die to self and live for Jesus that the world might see in us the Savior alive and lifted up, that they might come to know him too. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You can contact Duke Duvall at WTJR-TV, 222 North 6th Street, Quincy, Illinois, 62301, or go to his website, www.dukedevall.com. Be sure and join us again next week for Conquering Your Giants.